Hi, welcome back to Global Ed TV, uh, this series called Foundational Attitudes and Projects for Global Citizenship. And this is brought to you by the Global Education Conference Network and Know My World. And we're very happy to be here with you this evening. Um, this will be the last uh, session in our series for uh, this semester. Um, and we were really pleased to have everyone who have, has participated, joined, watched, listened, even though it's uh, typically asynchronous um, abilities, but that's what's so great about technology uh, is that we can still be a part of things even if we're not able to join in real time. So without further ado, we want to uh, get started with the last session of the series. So once again, just a reminder that this is brought to you by Global Education Conference Network, which is a collaborative, inclusive, worldwide community initiative that involves students, teachers, organizations at all levels. And uh, they're able to bring activities that are designed specifically to increase opportunities for connecting classrooms while supporting cultural awareness and recognition of diversity and educational access for all. So if you are not already a member, we highly encourage you to go ahead and join this network of over 25,000 participants in the world in over 180 countries. Um, and it's sure to be an uh, amazing space for you to get connected and to get great global ed resources. This was also created in partnership with Know My World. And Know My World is a global education resource. Uh, we coach teachers in digital shared learning experiences with classes, classrooms all over the world. And our primary focus is social, emotional, cultural, and academic learning. Uh, we offer a variety of programs and professional development opportunities to really support teachers to, uh, in bringing global ed into their learning community. So please check us out at knowmyworld.org. So uh, I would just like to begin this session with uh, looking at our audience. And, and if maybe if a few of you could please locate um, where you are on this map. And you can do that by selecting in the left-hand column where you'll see the chat menu and, and participants in the main room. There's this little icon that looks like a sun, like the sun. And if you click on that and then pull your arrow over to the map, you can just drop it on your location. So it looks like we already have someone in South America. And maybe you can type in the chat box too uh, exactly where you are in the world. I'll put this in here. So uh, we have Mexico, looks like uh, Northeast US. Um, let's see, any, any ideas here in the chat box? So we have Quetro, Mexico. And uh, Taiwan, Argentina, excellent. New York, cool. So we are really uh, wrapping up the world here. We're covering all the various corners. Costa Rica, excellent. So all these various corners of the world, it's great to have diversity uh, in, the, in the room today. Washington State, excellent, excellent. OK, so for time's sake, this is a super fun activity. You could do this all day. <laughs> but we'll just go forward and talk a little bit about uh, the series itself. So I'll just introduce myself. Uh, for those of you who are just joining now, my name is Lisa Petro. I'm the co-founder of Know My World and a curriculum development consultant. And I specialize in social and emotional learning, cultural competence, and global ed. And I've worked with a variety of learning communities from higher education, secondary ed, NGOs, uh, United Nations Commission on the Status of Women, and uh, designing uh, various professional development programs and curriculum for global education. And uh, I'm proud to give you a little overview of this series. Uh, so when Know My World, when we worked on this series, we actually borrowed from some uh, curriculum that we've already created in the world. And um, we were able to do a report on scaffolded projects that focus on social and emotional foundations and how they are necessary for the development of global citizens. So um, we're sharing this link with you. Uh, we do provide a resource list at the end of the session, so you'll be able to locate everything, including a bibliography of work and any additional links to um, programs and activities. And this is in there. So if you would like more information about the efficacy of some of these projects, you are welcome to check out our internal report that we hosted in 2015. 
And so for those of you that have been with us uh, the entire semester, we worked through five different projects. And the idea was that we were scaffolding these projects to see if we could make an impact on the foundational attitudes that we believe are necessary for global citizenship. And in those attitudes, we found that they're rooted in social and emotional learning. And so we've worked from identity to critical thinking, assumption stereotypes, how we communicate and the kinds of words that we choose. And now we're ending this series with the lesson needs and wants, um, a distinction to support adolescents in developing personal relationships in service learning. And so we're going to focus on what that looks like and what that means this, this evening. Uh, the key indicators that we are looking at in students' development, uh, what we're, we're, we're doing for. So the first is self-awareness, uh, an ability to have a knowledge of self-identity and personal reactions through critical thought. Of course, openness or willingness to accept diverse people and ideas and ways that invite multiple perspectives. Uh, sensitivity and awareness of the needs and responses of others and how we can manage those responses and beliefs and the ways that they impact our relationship with others. And then lastly, adaptability. So our ability to shift behaviors and participate in dualistic thinking so that we can co-construct power sharing in these diverse cross-cultural relationships. And for every project in this series, we provide a project rubric that measures these four key indicators from a limited or a very basic uh, ability to an advanced. Uh, ability, and so we share this with you as well, so that if you want to use these projects, you can uh, use this as an evaluation piece. Uh, all of these projects, again, are designed using Kolb's model of experiential learning, so the idea here is that we want to provide students with the, not just the theory, but also the practice, the, and build on the experiences that they naturally have in their lives, not just the ones that we support them in or construct in the classroom. Uh, so the idea there is that uh, as humans, we have concrete experiences, and they develop uh, in ways that we reflect and observe what we've experienced. And from that, we can derive these kind of abstract concepts about, you know, what did that mean, you know, and, and how did that affect me, and how does that affect others? And from there, we come up with new ideas about that experience. And we actively experiment with these new ideas in new experiences. Uh, and this is a cycle of learning. We continually build on this throughout our lives. So the idea in our projects is that students learn in this, uh, in this experiential fashion. And so some of the evidence is that you will see, uh, particularly in this, uh, sub in this uh, particular topic this week, is uh, qualitative uh, such as journal entries from students, also um, formative pieces like interviews and testimonials from students. Uh, we'll look at some of the quantitative uh, aspects like uh, surveys, which we have a, a, an additional survey that we've implemented for the completion of this series. And then also uh, in the summative, looking at the rubric evaluation, not just per project, but in totality for all of the projects in this series. And so now I'd just like to introduce uh, to you the global educator of this series uh, who has been hosting these projects uh, in her classroom this semester so we could provide you with real-time evidence. Um, and that's Genevieve Murphy. So Genevieve, do you want to just share a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, hello. And um, as Lisa said, thank you so much for joining us today um, in our final uh, session of this series. Um, my name is Genevieve Murphy, and I currently live and teach in Taichung, Taiwan. I work at the American School of Taichung, and I've been here for about six years. And uh, I work with Noma World to develop the cur curriculum that focuses on social, emotional, and cultural uh, learning, and um, and then I implement what we develop in the classroom. Uh, so I would like to introduce you to my students. Oh wait, <laughs> so before I do that, um, this is our model that we use when we are developing curriculum. Um, this is uh, areas that we feel are important to include uh, when um, 
developing curriculum and projects and programs um, because we feel that social and emotional aspects of education are just as important as the academic. And working in a international school, we have cultural diversity and a lot of teachers these days. Um, of course, have cultural diversity in their classrooms as well. So, teaching students um, awareness about who they are and how to interact with each other and to incorporate cultural aspects and understanding and empathy uh, while also covering academic content and standards. So, this is my school, uh, AST, and it is located in Dakin uh, in the foothills of. Uh, Jack and Martins, and it is a grade 1 through 12 school. And we are WASC accredited, and these are some of the standards that we incorporate. So we use Washington State standards and Common Core standards, as well as Next Gen Science standards. And we are affiliated with Coach and the S words over here uh, stands for Expected School-Wide Learning Results. And this is actually a lot of where our content focuses. So teaching students to be lifelong learners and critical thinkers, effective communicators, cooperative individuals, productive persons, global citizens, and responsible individuals. So that, we feel, is just as important as the Common Core and Washington State standards. And these are my students. Um, I have 11 students from five different countries. And they have worked uh, with me uh, this past year in all of these projects. And so it's been great getting to see their development and watch them grow in maturity as well as just awareness of themselves and uh, respect and compassion for each other. Great. Thank you, Genevieve. I appreciate that. And I'm going to miss those guys because we've spent this whole semester uh, learning about them and learning about how they view the world and how these, um, these skills and these attitudes and this information we've shared with them has really supported them in transforming uh, who they are as they go into fourth grade. So <laughs> uh, thank you for that, Genevieve. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about why we wanted to complete this series uh, with um, service learning. The idea here is that we're creating scaffolded learning, right? We want to be able to build on not only the individual, but also the group patterns of how students learn. And so the idea here is that we've given them this kind of process to demonstrate awareness, openness, sensitivity, adaptability, those key indicators, in order to put that into social action. We want to know that they've been able to create mutual learning relationships with not just their peers, with each other, but also with people in their community at large. Um, so when we talk about the series as a whole, we've sort of worked through these five primary goals and objectives. In the beginning, we looked at identity. We wanted to lay that foundation for cultural awareness and for uh, identity of self and also the uh, awareness of others' identities and how they see themselves. And then we took it from there. Once we had that foundation, we worked into like this subjectivity. So we looked at critical thinking. We looked at perspective. We learned actually in that session about the various uh, stages of critical thought and uh, from, from Deanna Kuhn and how uh, students at this age group are teetering on the what is so, the fact, versus being able to be subjective and see a variety of what could be right in the world. There isn't one particularly right answer. From here, we move them into labeling. It was a natural sort of progression. You have an identity. You can think critically, and you can see a variety of perspectives from different identities. How does that work in shaping the way we make assumptions and label others in the world? So we stepped into that piece. And then last month when we met, we looked at ownership. So now that you have this information, how does that translate in your ability to communicate with others? And so as we've mentioned, we're looking in third grade. And of course, this stuff is, a, is developmentally appropriate. It doesn't mean that you can't modify this for different 
age groups of students. But in this particular age group in third grade, we want it to focus on vocabulary and choosing words, supporting students and looking for alternative ways of communication. And so naturally, we've ended up here where we've got these core skills and we want to support them in taking that into the larger community and being very clear about uh, the distinctions of what they need and what people want, right? So in this particular uh, session, we're going to work on students demonstrating responsibility in planning and implementing a service learning project. We want to know that they understand the value of service learning and also that they're able to be responsible and accountable to others when they're working in, uh, in communities. So in this uh, project overview, we're covering uh, two particular areas, social and emotional competence and cultural competence, helping students build relationship skills, making responsible decisions, and then for cultural competence, they're going to touch on cultural sensitivity and also intercultural communication. And the learning outcomes that we've anticipated from this was an ability to recognize the difference between needs and wants through group dialogue, sorting exercises, and critical inquiry, to also be able to express their needs clearly and effectively in a social setting through role-playing exercises and self-reflective journaling. We want them to demonstrate and reflect on the impact of expressing needs clearly through role-playing techniques with their peers and in group discussion. And lastly, the biggest outcome is applying those strategies for effective communication, including clarifying intimate needs, investigating perspectives, shifting behavior and tone and active listening, all so that they can work with others in a community service learning project. Uh, and as we promised, we always uh, align these to the state and common core standards to support you if you want to uh, integrate this into your curriculum at some point. Uh, so specifically for this age group, uh, we've covered two social study standards in the Washington state. And also for common core, we're looking at writing, speaking and listening, and language uh, to support the development there. Okay, so, so let's ask the big question when working with students. Interestingly enough, there is not a lot of research uh, around service learning and young children. Primarily, you're going to find it in high school and higher ed. So when we're working with young kids, we really want to hit into, okay, what is social responsibility? What does that mean? How can we help students of, of, of this age group, of this developmental level, really go beyond the concept of personal responsibility, which we were talking about last month, to becoming caring, caring citizens. And so if we look at the research that is there, we can see that social responsibility is directly related to a couple of interesting key social theories. For example, social capital theory and social learning theory. This is something that happens within the group. And in this particular definition by Gallet, he says, reflecting concerns that extend beyond personal wants, needs, or gains. So we're going beyond just the perception of self and just what we desire or what we wish to desire. So in order to do that, we have to go back to something we covered early in the series, and that was Vygotsky and the positioning theory. So when we think about positioning, the way we position ourselves, right, positioning theory states that it's the way we see ourselves in the world in relation to others and also the way that we place or categorize others based on what we know or what we believe, essentially. So this determines how we see our own needs and values compared to others. And this develops in us a sense of validation and motivation. What do we want? What do we think we need? Now, social responsibility through service learning is actually this reciprocal exchange of mutual benefit. So again, it's calling us outside of ourselves. And that social, emotional, and cultural competence piece that we're working on, well, that supports people, or in this case, young, young students, in assuming social responsibility based on mutual empowerment because they're going out beyond themselves. So that's really where we are in terms of the development. And so this is why we decided to create a project that focuses on needs and wants. We want students to start thinking deeply about their desires 
and the distinctions of what they need versus what they want and what others need and what others want as well. So when we look at the development of social responsibility in adolescence, well, we can look at some interesting research. So this is uh, some research from Astuto and Ruck, and they talk about key executive functions that create these kind of pro-social behaviors for civic engagement. And so those three executive functions are sort of like this praxis between the cognitive and the social and emotional learning. Uh, so you can see, right, first, inhibition. So can students uh, suspend certain needs of self in order to meet the needs of others? Do they have a working memory? Are they able to maintain information while they're reasoning with additional information? So they have a foundational piece of understanding, new information brought on by others comes into the situation, and can they grapple and reason with both bodies of information? And then lastly is that cognitive flexibility. So can they consider others' perspectives? And based on that perspective, make adjustments to meet the social good or the, or the, or the um, shared power within the group. And so these are the three sort of developmental levels we want to look at when we're talking about creating social responsibility in adolescence. So if you bring in service learning, now we're talking about an instructional strategy, or more clearly in other research, we're talking about an instructional methodology. Okay? Service learning is intended to, it's, it goes beyond charity, right? It incorporates the academic, it incorporates content and context, and it partners it with these community experiences so we can go just deeper than just volunteering our time, but actually building these kind of relationships, learning. In this kind of experiential process, we need to use the social, emotional, and cultural skills with all of the stakeholders in order to create those meaningful relationships. So it looks like three tiers in this kind of Venn diagram, right? So you have your objectives, what academic content are you looking at, and you also have your social and emotional objectives. You know, what kind of uh, abilities do you want your students or attitudes to really participate in? And then you have your community engagement. What is the community that you're interacting with? How are you using uh, these kinds of skills to create meaningful relationships, to build relationships? And then lastly is that shared service. So instead of donating money or donating clothes, is there a way that you're creating mutual empowerment where both your students and the community that you're working with can contribute powerfully to this experience. So at Know My World, when we do this in our projects, we sort of have this, this, this process. And um, I'll start at the bottom of the light bulb where you kind of screw in, where you plug in. So you plug into connecting with the community. And then from there, you want to distinguish your own needs with the needs of others. What do we want from this? What are we looking to gain? What are we looking to contribute? And then vice versa, also understanding your partner's needs and requests and contributions. Once all of that information is put into the pool, then you can create a shared goal. Okay, based on this needs and wants and these informations, what can we create together? So you co-construct an interactive experience. Then you'll apply the necessary communication skills to maintain and manage that experience. And then lastly, you want to make sure that you reflect on it to, to discover that meaning, but also that you follow up, because this happens sometimes. We, we do these great projects, and then we complete them, and that's that. Uh, we don't talk to anybody anymore. We, we kind of end the relationship. The project's done. The grade is in, and that's that. So we really want to make sure that we maintain a relationship. Relationships are ephemeral. They're always changing. And so it's really important that students know that they, there's, an, there's a long term, there's a lasting effect of, of, that, of that shared energy. So um, Genevieve, I'm going to turn it over to you now so that you can um, show us what you've done with our Know My World classroom and talk a little bit about preparing for such an impacting uh, experience. Great. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, this is just kind of a run through um, about 
how I create um, a safe space in my classroom. So throughout the series, we've discussed the importance and value of creating a, a safe space in your classroom, um, especially when you are teaching and learning uh, topics that incorporate social and emotional learning, because a lot of those are really deep conversations um, that kind of um, leave, has the potential to leave students vulnerable, because um, they're sharing really personal ideas and thoughts. So creating a safe space is really uh, vital to um, having, uh, I guess, a, good, a cooperative learning environment where students feel that it's okay to share these ideas. So what we do um, at AST is every morning we start the day with about 15 minutes of yoga and five minutes of quiet time. So it's 20 minutes. It's literally as soon as the first bell rings, um, the students are already in the gym. Uh, that's where the bus drops them off. And in their supply list, we ask them to bring a yoga mat. And so each student has their own mat, and we have, have lead them through uh, yoga and quiet time. So this is a really good way to help them get in touch with their bodies um, physically as well as emotionally and mentally. And then um, class discussions, uh, again, throughout the series, you've seen examples of various class discussions, and you'll see a few more <laughs> in this um, today as well. And so this is really important um, because these are open-ended questions that you can use to start any unit. And they last for about 10 to 20 minutes, just depending on how involved the students are in the discussion. And again, it's important that you use open-ended questions to kind of probe student thinking and get them to uh, contemplate these new ideas. And then student acknowledgement is very important. So things that the students say and share, be sure to acknowledge them or write them on the board. Even if it's not exactly on track, just acknowledge their effort and maybe help kind of curve the answer or scaffold the answer in the direction that um, you're wanting it to go. Um, so these are all definitely important things to do and good ways to create uh, a safe space in, in the classroom for students. And then the next step is how to create your own service learning experience with your students. And uh, Lisa mentioned some of these in um, her slide with the Venn diagram, but it's really, really important that um, you include your students in this process. So this isn't um, where a teacher decides everything and then comes in and tells your students what they're going to do. Uh, give the students ownership and responsibility in the process. So again, that's done through communication um, and classroom discussions. So talking with your students to identify a need in the community. Um, so I guess I need to specify like uh, this. It's probably it's different, I think, with older students than it is with elementary students. So definitely talking with students about problems and issues. Um, but it is a bit more teacher-led with elementary. But definitely with middle and high school students, they can go out and uh, to the community and research or find organizations that they can connect with and send out those introductory emails or letters and things like that. So they can have a lot more ownership over the over the, um, the, over the grade levels. But um, so again, talking with your students and then finding organizations or groups within the community that work in that realm, and then creating that relationship with them. So going to the organization and talking with people or inviting them to come to the school to talk with them, or creating dialogue through email, whatever way works best with your school. Um, but it's really important that you create um, something with the organization. Um, again, so we're not just coming in and deciding what it is that we think we need, but we're actually serving, um, meeting a need that they actually have. And so then identify what the needs are and then how students um, can contribute to a solution or to help reduce the problem in some way, shape, or form 
again, that works cooperatively with the organization. And then um, after that, allow the students as much ownership as possible in creating um, the event um, or the activities or whatever it is that you guys decide together. Um, allow them to kind of take the reins and figure out the best way to create a successful um, event. And then lastly, put that um, into action um, by actually going uh, to the place and doing the service for any project. So needs and wants, we discussed uh, together as a class, and so this is one of our class discussion notes. And so the students were able to identify the difference between needs and wants. And this is how they explained the difference. And then we made a list of things that they need and things that they want. And then there was this in-between stage where uh, some felt that they needed it and some felt that they wanted it. Um, so based on their definition that if you don't, if, if, that you will die if you don't have it as a need, some things like friends and money, uh, they weren't exactly 100% sure one way or the other. Um, so. It was a really good discussion, and they were able to vocalize the difference between the two um, pretty clearly. And then they had their sorting activity. So this is just a categorizing activity where they work with partners. Um, and I used a think pair share method with them um, to implement this activity. And so they worked with partners, um, and they were given a stack of cards, and they had to again categorize it as a need or a want, and then they had to discuss uh, with their partners um, why they felt each of the items was in that particular category. So again, this is just invoking their own thought process to kind of really um, not just identify or classify, but also be able to explain and understand why um, it's there. And then uh, this is just a great picture. They're very proud of themselves for completing this work. <laughs> so then we moved into uh, the service learning project. And so part of what they needed to do, um, the students needed to do, is raise some money. So um, they decided that they wanted to do a big sale. So they Actually, pretty excited about that um, because, of course, the creators love cookies. Uh, but they uh, either made something at home. Um, those who were in the cooking class made cookies in their classroom with, the, with that teacher, um, or they brought something from home, and then they were responsible for deciding how much each item was going to cost. And um, they made tickets uh, for the to give. People who were buying the items, um, and then the person at the end was responsible for the money. So they would collect the tickets for the amount of money that they spent, and then collect the actual money. So they really enjoyed um, getting to um, play with the money and the food. Again, this is where we can great math skills. Um, it was quite a successful big sale. And then, so our service learning project, uh, just as a brief overview, was to go to a local temple. And um, this is where a lot of elders gather um, each day, and they just do kind of like a community center, but it's at a temple. Um, and so different mem community members come to the temple and lead them in different activities. Um, and so what they really wanted to do when we talked with them was to um, make this uh, tongyuan, which is rice ball soup, it's a traditional Taiwanese soup. And they wanted to teach the students how to make this. And so the big sale money went to buying all of the supplies um, uh, for this soup. Um, and so it's great because they got to experience some cultural learning and it was kind of a tradition. Um, this is a well-known dish in Taiwan and so the elders felt that this was important 
to pass on that tradition to a younger generation. So um, it was really a great experience, and you can see by the pictures that uh, the kids really enjoyed it, and they jumped right in, and they had a lot of fun um, making it. So that was what the elders wanted to contribute. And then the students' um, job was to plan games and activities to play with the elders. And so they came up with different games they could play at the table, and then they also did like this beach ball relay race. Um, and so we had, again, two class discussions. We talked about different activities, and then we voted, and we wrote it down. And then they were in charge of explaining the rules to the tables um, and leading the activities. So that we had complete ownership in that process. And then the dance team wanted to perform and uh, share what they've been looking on learning um, in their after school activity. And um, so they had a chance to do that um, with another audience besides just school and parents. Um, before we went on the trip, uh, we had, again, a class discussion, <laughs> um, and we talked about worries and assumptions. So this was to help us kind of tie into what, we had what the students had learned um, previously um, about labels and uh, perspectives and seeing things. And so this was a list of things that they were worried about. Um, because the elders are um, an older generation, they predominantly speak Taiwanese, whereas most of the students speak Mandarin or um, Chinese, um, and some only spoke English. So they were worried that there would be a communication problem. And some were scared because they were strangers, they don't know them. Um, they were worried they might not be smart and they might not be able to see well, and they felt they might be uncomfortable because they weren't in the same peer group or age level. And they were worried that they were strangers, and as older grandparents tend to do, they like to touch their grandkids a lot, um, so they were worried that they would be touched on the head or cheeks or whatnot. And, um, Lastly, they were worried that they wouldn't have enough energy to play the game in activity. So that was the list before. And then after, they were able to kind of again see this change and shift. And they were able to see that there wasn't any problems with communication due to translators. And everyone was really nice. And they had a great time. And they could see perfectly fine. And uh, they were able to play the game. and. Um, participate without any problems. Um, so all of their worries were kind of put to ease after the experience. And then we had a discussion about why or how um, this sort of learning project connected to needs and wants. And so they were able to identify areas of needs that um, were outside of typical things like food and shelter and water, that they re recognized that time and love and attention were also equally important. And so through the service learning project, that's what they were able to give and share um, with the elders at the temple. And also receive time and love and attention from them. So it was really beautiful for them to kind of have that aha moment and recognize like, oh, this is how these two things connect. And and what we were able to share and what we were able to, to receive from that experience. And this is a whole group photo. And I just wanted to share that this is our third year going to this temple. Um, they keep inviting us back um, each year because they really enjoy spending time with the kids. And this is um, a really great way for the students to be able to um, apply all of these skills that they've been learning throughout the year. Um, in their leadership course and uh, this program that we're doing um, with them and really apply all of the topics. And they are really respectful and they learn how to just be sensitive and aware um, of others. And it's just a really great uh, experience for, for both the students and the others. And so this is us wrapping up at the end of the day, and everyone's smiling and laughing, and just a 
of all high energy and good experience. This is an evaluation of a couple of the students, again, using the rubric that we socialized with at the beginning. Um, and just a way to help evaluate the students' um, experience and, and growth. And this was the impact. So we were able to, the students were able to recognize what they gave. So again, going back to that connection to our discussion about needs and wants, they were able to give love, friendship, time, attention, English practice. That was one of the activities we taught the elders, like animal means in English. Um, respect and laughter. And then what the elders gave to them was food. They taught them how to make a traditional Taiwanese soup and lessons. So this one I thought was really beautiful. Um, they said that they learned that they needed to be kind to their elders um, and be patient with them. And they recognized that they learned responsibility. So through the bake sale, preparing the games, and then the way they acted and behaved at the temple on that on the actual day were all things that they learned through this process. And again, the reiteration of love, time, attention, and happiness. So it was really um, a great conversation just to see what they had learned through, through that experience. And then we had like a final uh, discussion just about the program and all of the um, topics that we discussed throughout this series and what it was that they were able to remember and and what they learned from from all of these and um, so it was just a really great list and, and it covered the board and they were really able to share a lot of what they remembered learning um, perspectives being a big one um, every time we talked about leadership um, or had these group discussions, perspectives came up. So it was great because that's not really a topic that's understood by eight-year-olds, um, but they just reiterated that concept over and over in these discussions, which helped um, me to understand that they really got what that meant and the value of perspective. Um, and I think that that's a huge thing for students to be able to know and um, remember and understand as they go through life because really everything in life is perspective. So being able to understand that you can change your perspective and change your experience um, is really, really powerful um, and valuable. And then this is a list of modifications. Um, again, you can modify this anyway, a million ways, um, just based on your classroom, your student uh, dynamic, your community needs, um, so these are just some examples and ideas, um, but it's really just identifying a service project um, or a need in your community and then giving student ownership and developing a project around that need. And if they need to incorporate fundraisers, um, they can, and then um, they can document the experience digitally so if they want to do like a, um, any kind of blog or, or blog or video. Um, throughout the process, and that's a really great way to include technology. Um, and then interviews. So interviews are always really powerful. Um, it can be with the people that they are um, working with, or it could be even amongst themselves and their classmates based on identifying what they learned throughout that experience. And that's about it. Great. Thank you, Genevieve. Um, so as we mentioned at the end of all of these um, projects, we share with you the lesson plan sequence, and uh, you can find that uh, on our resource packet. Uh, I'm going to put that up there now. Uh, you'll find this link and the link to the study and a variety of other links. And Stella, I'm going to add in um, the, the link that you provided with us for us in the chat box, too. But uh, you can go to that resource link and uh, find this information. We're actually uh, sort of wrapping the um, 
piece about the project itself for this session a little early because we wanted to share you with the summative assessment process. Uh, we promised to, in the beginning of the series that we would support you in, in, in not just um, providing these powerful projects to your students and modifying them if, if needed, but also um, being able to evaluate and assess that, that there's been an impact and that there's been growth. Um, so a couple of sessions ago, two sessions ago, we shared with you the formative piece um, how we've checked in mid-range and how we were able to make notations through, you know, journals, testimonials from students, interviews, um, classroom discussions, just to keep on track with where they're going. Um, but in this segment, we really wanted to tell you about the accumulation of, of the five projects. And it is the end of the school year um, for AST in Taiwan and for many of you in other parts of the world. Um, and if it's not the end of the school year, then it's uh, the end of the semester. You might be getting prepared for winter break in about a month or so. So I think that this is a really valuable piece. Um, so in terms of the summative uh, assessment piece here, as we mentioned, we were looking at two primary areas. We were looking at the formative, which would be changes, notation of changes in students, and then also the developmental or the summative, how have they grown. And we did this by creating a portfolio. So what that means is that we were able to take examples from the qualitative experience. So any results kids made from the activities, um, journal entries, pictures they drew, any kind of artifact, video, uh, whatever, uh, dialogue around the concepts. If you notice, Genevieve um, has done a great job at documenting uh, her, uh, the, the discussions and whiteboards, making lists and, and visual maps and, and word clouds and things like that. And then also new patterns of behavior in the student and classroom community. So as a global educator, she's making observations and she's making personal notes about where she's seen students be challenged or um, have a breakthrough. Um, so these kinds of qualitative uh, uh, pieces go into the portfolio. And the quantitative, we were looking at statistics from the rubric's results. So we made an accumulation of the rubric results. We also looked at statistics from a multiple choice survey that we gave at the end of the five projects uh, about two weeks ago. And then also, um, which we're not going to share with you, but it's something to be considered as a quantitative measurement is grades from student work, especially if you're looking at ELA and you're using the common core standards that uh, we've suggested or other ones. You want to make sure that the student's grades reflect um, them meeting those objectives and those outcomes. And so what we did is we developed a Google survey. In the past, we've done written surveys. We've also done pictograph surveys, which is really helpful if you've got young kids. So giving them uh, a choice of pictures, and they can circle which one is most closely related to what you're asking. But in this case, we were able to do a Google form. And we asked students four multiple choice questions that reflected the main principles of the project. So instead of directly asking them about identity or perspective. We ask them things like, uh, when I get upset with my friends, I will. And then we give them three options in a multiple choice, one of them obviously being the, the best answer that we're looking for. Um, so for example, in this question, when I get upset with my friends, I will think about my friend's perspective and talk to them. I will. Uh, shout my opinion at them until they listen to me, or I will avoid talking to them until they just forget about it. And so we want to see how they're going to respond to that. We also included two open-ended questions that provide related experiences and opinions for the individual students. So we want them to reflect and have a little bit more of a higher order thinking uh, to see if they can actually synthesize the lessons that we were trying to teach them and put that into some kind of practical experience that they've had or they're having in their life. So we took results from this survey. We had some statistics, of course, to see what percentage of students were able to answer the multiple choice correctly, et cetera, and also the individual profile. Then we evaluated the rubrics. So we made this spreadsheet. As you can see, there's four, the four key indicators, awareness, openness, sensitivity, adaptability. And then there's the five projects that we offered throughout the semester. And of course, we have one of those for each of the students. To simplify and to make something a little more quantifiable, we assigned a numerical value 
to the different indications on the rubric. For example, if it was limited, they got a 1. If they were in a moderate, they got a 2. And if they landed in advanced, they got a 3. And here, we can look for areas of change. So again, a lot of times we're, as educators, we can get overly concerned with the summative. Did they develop? Did they go to the next level? But changes are really important as well. The changes tell us that there's a learning experience happening, right? We've all heard about the teachable moments. And so if there's changes, even if it appears that a student might be regressing, for example, perhaps they were in advance in the awareness project, but then they ended up being in um, moderate for the labeling project. Well, there's a change there, and there's a reason. They're being confronted by something in that labeling project. And it doesn't mean that they're going backwards or that we've misjudged them, but it does mean there's an opportunity for growth and learning happening there. So this is what's really great about putting the rubrics in, in this uh, numerical value and assessing them uh, for the changes, not just the development. So once we had all of this information, then we put everything together in that portfolio and we did a comparison and a contrast. And we looked at all of the evidence. We looked at how did the student, where were the changes in the rubric? Where was the growth in the rubric? Does this match what they've provided us in the artifacts? Does this match what they've drawn, what they've said in the interviews, what they uh, answered in the survey? And then this way we can make a whole child assessment not just based on trends or patterns or where we think they're supposed to be, but actually getting an accurate view of, of who they are and how they're learning in their own, in their own way, in their own development. And so lastly, before we kind of open it up to a few questions and wrap it up, I also wanted to share with you some of the cumulative results and trends. Uh, this is helpful for us. Now, yes, these students are, are ending, they're completing this grade, and chances are, in many cases, they're not all going to go into the same class. Some will, and this will be incredibly valuable information to pass on to the next teacher who will have this, this entire class together. But even for those that are, are kind of separating and going different ways, it's interesting to see how the group has grown together and how some of these personalities have interacted with one another in these backgrounds. And so when we did the cumulative rubric results, and, and I, I would, again, I would not say that this is, you know, publishable research, but we do want to look to see, you know, what are the patterns? What are the trends that emerged? So um, some interesting things that we could see here, right? We can definitely tell that students have advanced when it comes to awareness. They were steadily, the, steady, the steady average of students placed in moderate, and then that became more of the norm by the time they hit the service learning projects, with 81% of them all moving into advanced. So we know that there's a steady growth there. We can also see some <clears throat> interesting things, too, about the projects. For example, if you look at a project like communication, there had been a fairly steady um, um, struggle in terms of these four key indicators. Communication clearly was a little bit more of a challenge for them. And if you really hone in on the indicators, you can see that sensitivity overall was the most challenging uh, experience for them. So we can make some deductions from that. We can make some generalizations in those trends. I did want to point out that there were some limitations in this. And, and again, this is not necessarily a formidable uh, quantifiable uh, report, but taking into consideration for the qualitative piece, you know, there were two students, for example, absent for the identity project. So that's going to give you an incomplete assessment of the total classroom project pro progress. Also, those really high results in community service learning, especially around that openness piece, this could also be the result of pre-existing knowledge and learned behaviors that maybe some stems from some cultural backgrounds in Taiwan or also just family values within the family construct that, you know, you're supposed to respect the elderly and, and, um, or, or just the experience they have at home with their own grandparents. So these are things to consider. And then lastly, we do suggest that if you, if you use this method in your classroom, whether it's for a midterm assessment or for a year-end assessment, you want to make sure that you restructure those survey questions to add a little more complexity with those student responses. Because we did, we were able to identify this trend of 
of, um, of memory and that they were able to absorb and really um, get this information. But you also want to, I, I think, sort of um, exclude or, or rule out that this was regurgitation as well. So definitely be willing to be uh, creative with the survey questions. And so some of the general conclusions that we came to about this series um, based on this information. Number one, clearly repeated exposure to social, emotional, and cultural concepts in the classroom will show an increase of awareness of self and others. There is no doubt about that. Um, and we were able to establish that from these rubrics and from a variety of other qualitative examinations. Students were able to retain and become more aware about these concepts we wanted to introduce to them. Also, uh, students were able to demonstrate the expected learning outcomes we laid out for them and retain the information around these concepts that we wanted them to know, particularly the skills that we taught them for building effective relationships. So they were all able to place in either a moderate or advanced uh, area by the end of this assessment. No one was in the limited. Uh, Another continued project, they should include more emphasis and opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer activities that develop sensitivity and empathy building. So this would be something you'd want to pass on uh, when your curriculum developer or your, or your teachers are creating for next year's work. They want to understand that this is a, a weak area, so to speak, and they can leverage other strengths like the strength of awareness and being open so they can provide more peer-to-peer -peer activities in helping, supporting them in the development of sensitivity. And then lastly, critical thinking can be expanded into more detailed descriptions and writing construction. Um, so for our ELA component, if you want to build on that, we were able to help them identify vocabulary and we were able to help them understand perspective taking and communication, but there needs to be a stronger writing construction as we've seen in their journal entries where they're using feeling words, they're locating time and place, they're using expressions and they're recounting memory um, and that would be in alignment with some of those ELA standards. So these were our general conclusions. Um, and again, this is that link, so I, I, I please encourage you to go and, and take advantage of the resources and the readings that we've shared for you. Um, and if there are, what's happening, sorry. If there are any questions, any burning questions, we've got about three minutes left, we can take them or comments. Anything in here? Did we miss anything or anything you'd like to see more of? Okay. All right. Well, as I mentioned, this information is available to you. Thank you, Makeda. Um, Thank you, and I really appreciate your attendance and your participation. Um, and just because this series is completed, it doesn't mean that uh, we don't welcome any questions or ideas or collaborations that you would like to uh, pursue. So please, I'll put our, uh, our emails in the chat box here before we leave, and we welcome uh, your ideas and your responses in the future. We'd love to continue to work with everyone and find out what you're up to as well. So just a reminder, upcoming global education events, ISTE is coming. It's, I think, two weeks away or a week and a half away. Um, so if you're up for Global Education Day, I believe it's in San Antonio, Texas this year. Sunday, June 25th, check them out. Also, the Global Education Fair is coming in the fall. So uh, please follow these links to learn more about how you can participate in that. And of course, if you have not joined the Global Education Conference Network, and uh, these recordings will be available for you on YouTube at the Global Education Conference site and also emailed out to our registered participants. Um, so we really thank you so much for your time and your energy. And we were just absolutely honored to provide and share this information with all of you. And we hope to connect with you again in the future. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>